Hello, hi everyone, and welcome to Aquarian Radio at AquarianRadio.com. I am your host, Janet Kerr Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and this is an episode of Cosmic College. And we have a very special guest today with us, Neil Freer, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. But Dr. Lesson, what would you like to say before we bring on Neil? Well, just that this is it. This is the age of Aquarius. This is the Sata Yuga. This is a thousand years of uh, things are going to get way better, and we're going to um, uh, meet galactic society uh, as full on um, people who are entitled to let their light shine. And, and Neil is uh, our leading philosopher in this field, and we're going to uh, look at some ways to do this. So, Neil, uh, introduce yourself and tell us, how is this new society, what is it going to look like? Well, um, an introduction, um, <laughs> talking about background, would probably take way too long. I, I okay. have worn a number of hats, um, uh, but... Um, the my website uh, uh, gives my bio as a futant, f u t a n t, which uh, um, I'm part of the one and a half to two percent of the population that at any given time um, constitutes the futants, uh, future mutants, uh, the uh, evolutionary scouts. Uh, we, it's Cultural like, uh, creatives. I'm sorry, yes, okay, cultural creatives. Um, and uh, Tim Leary invented that term, by the way, and uh, it, when I asked him what it really meant, he said, well, it's future mutants, and uh, you understand it in terms of the analogy of the uh, beehive, um, where the uh, honeybees go out and search out the, bee, the honey and uh, find out where the best places are. Then they come back and they do that waggle-ass dance uh, to tell everybody else where to where it's at, and um, the Putins uh, come back and respectfully say, <laughs> I think this is the direction, this is the trajectory uh, that we ought to follow uh, to evolve as uh, rapidly and consciously as possible. And so um, uh, I'm a futurist, and um, C.B. Scott Jones and I form a uh, CosmicHumanity.org. Uh, you can see it as CosmicHumanity.org uh, think tank, a virtual think tank. And um, one of our uh, pro uh, agendas recently has been uh, to contact the uh, uh, academics any place on the planet uh, to get them to uh, uh, acknowledge and study and criticize and write white papers on the alien situation in general. And uh, we found that um, we could not get a single bite uh, from any academic on the planet, practically. Um, and uh, there was one who was willing to talk about why, and uh, it was a dean of a Midwestern college, and he said, tell us um, if tomorrow the government, uh, who gives out the, so much funding, um, and funding to him, uh, came to me and said, yeah, do you want to do this? You, would you do this for us? Would you uh, study this situation and uh, write and uh, instruct uh, the general population? He said, I would do it in RP because it's one of the biggest, the most important topics that we could deal with at this point. But in the meantime, um, until the government says, yeah, let's do it, uh, I don't want to be, he said, I don't want even to be caught thinking about it <laughs> because uh, <laughs> the next day uh, all the funding that I have received from other topics uh, would be cut off. Um, they play hardball. Don't want right. that work done. Okay. Well, this so, is all uh, part of the. This is all part of the uh, matrix of debt that uh, the uh, Illuminati, the uh, covert government, has deliberately wound this planet into, and this is all uh, part of the the age that we're leaving behind. We don't need this uh, way of uh, slavery, debt slavery, and we don't need this way of intellectual slavery where you lose your job and lose your funding if you don't toe the line. You know what? The intellect is so strong that if we, if you, if we are given enough time to present the information, the evidence, and the uh, structure of hypotheses that have developed from empirically, their intellects can't deny 
there is an ET presence, and uh, our history is uh, as a genetically engineered race. Sure. And the other, and those are two major cover-ups. The third major cover-up is the existence and nature of the tenth planet, <laughs> uh, which right. was rediscovered in 1983 by the Iris uh, Satellite Telescope, Infrared Imaging te- Telescope, um, published three, six times in the mainstream news. Uh, sixth time was January 11th, um, New York Times interview um, uh, where one of the uh, members of the, the Iris team uh, said uh, that um, astronomers, um, he didn't say just the team, he said astronomers are so uh, aware of it um, that um, we're so sure of it that all we need to do now is, is name it. And uh, at that time, the shades came down. Because these three uh, topics, uh, the general alien situation, our uh, genetic creation and part alien uh, nature, and um, and the and, and therefore the nature of religions because um, the Anunnaki, the alien civilization from the tenth planet, who colonized this planet and eventually created us as a uh, slave species to do the d- dirt digging in their gold mines, which we've already discovered, by the way, in uh, Central East Africa at a hundred thousand years old. Um, they, that uh, all those three paradigms, um, cover-ups, are inextricably interrelated. And so that's why um, they're either ignored or discounted or, or whatever. Um, well, you know, Neil, there's a fourth one that I, I really have to say that if we break the truth embargo, we're going to see that the uh, covert government has murdered billions of people millions in this uh, century even and uh and there's a culpability and we're all you know in a way we're all guilty because we haven't uh, stopped the uh, military industrial machine from grinding this uh the life out of people uh and so there's nothing to hold any if we can just get to the truth and realize that m- systematic violence and murder is uh, and warfare has been programmed into us so that we won't realize our commonality and get out of this mess and we'll continue to be it's also uh, alerters because of the we have the cures for these diseases we have the cures for aging we have these things and they are being denied to us so over 100,000 people a day die from you know, quote unquote, natural causes, which are diseases and aging, but they could they could be cured. So there's only like one half of one percent of the population that uh, die from like accidents. So these are all murders. We're all being murdered. Uh, t- totally agree. Totally agree. And um, right here in Santa Fe, where I live, um, when I um, pass it, uh, there is a, a National Cemetery, um, and when you look um, at the hill uh, of these row after row after row of white crosses, um, people that have died uh, as soldiers or whatever, um, it, it is so vast. I mean, it is as large as a huge uh, metropolitan block. Uh, or maybe two of them, and I, it, it, I, you know, I look at it as I go by, and and I think to myself, I'm looking, I'm looking at at uh, primitive insanity. Um, yes, it, that's exactly right. It's an insanity that's been programmed in. Yeah, yeah. So where do we go from here? Well, I well, think we that, go um, to hope. Yeah, let let Neil say his, and then we'll go. Neil, you have a theory. Where do we go from here? I'll ask the question. Well, um, without being facetious about it, uh, I, I would say that we are already into it. It is happening, um, but it is either condemned or ignored, or it's um, uh, covered up. Um, and when I say that, it, what is honest? A third, a third new paradigm of a completely new 
uh, social structure of a new society, planetary society this time, not just a nation or um, civilization, but a planetary society. And I think that to, to understand it best is that we know, everybody knows, uh, that uh, although it is it is denied, well, everybody knows that we, what we need to do is to get beyond primitive competition, whether it be economic, political, uh, whatever, uh, football. <laughs> um, it, and we need to move towards planetary cooperation, or else we simply will be just left on the sidelines until uh, such time as we do, because um, we, we've been told uh, repeatedly by alien civilizations that uh, you know if you uh, unless you get to be a unified planetary peaceful species um, we're not really interested in allowing you to matriculate into stellar society so um, one if we look at the general situation um, and and see that uh, the new generations, the kids coming up, um, helped by the transparency of the web and and just by the evolutionary uh, push uh, internally uh, that they are experiencing and the fact that they are evolving, um, many of them, uh, coming off the assembly line, um, Particularly with the Chinese, they they're, they're they're watching for these kids. They're coming off the assembly line with um, gifts, uh, with abilities that we previously considered to be paranormal, and uh, whether it be telepathy or uh, remote viewing or uh, whatever, uh, they for them it's it's normal, and. Uh, we need to support them. Uh, we need to educate them. We need to expand the educational situation to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, help them achieve the, the greatest potential of those uh, gifts that they they have, um, and uh, we and understand that um, we need to integrate those capabilities and those types of comp communication into into a new society uh, and uh, we can um, we can redefine the spiritual and the metaphysical in terms of uh, dimensionality uh, that these these kids and and a lot of, of the adults um, have uh, expanded uh, perception uh, greater perception of dimensionality, uh, not just the three of, um, that we we have been working with for a long time, but time is is another uh, dimension, and even beyond that. Um, and so, uh, anyway, I I I suppose I I should uh, let up here. <laughs> Well, I, think, I love what you're saying. One of the things I find uh, I, when I was doing my field work in uh, ethnography, uh, that uh, competition, rather than being intrinsically uh, a, a bring down, can really be enhanced. Uh, there was a, We needed a new district, a Kava house, and so the two sides, they're called moieties, so the village had a competition. Whoever would build their side of the roof first, uh, the other side would make a big party for them. And that kind of thing, it's, can, you can be, you can... Uh, manage competition so it becomes cooperation and it becomes a uh, synergy, you know, like infinity tennis. How many times can you and I hit the ball over collectively? And so I, I think that uh, rather than demonize competition, I think it's perhaps interesting to bring it to a higher um, uh, vibration. <laughs> okay. Totally agreed. Um, <clears throat> when I'm talking about primitive competition, I'm thinking in terms of the uh, winner and losers. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. Losers. That's what's bad. We don't need losers. 
the problem, the way I analyze it, is hierarchy. I think that some people's light is worth more than others, and richism it takes its worst form, I think, in royalty. Like, there's some people that are better, and they're, they should have more say in everything because of who their parents were. I think that's bizarre. Well, absolutely. Uh, if we talk about it and in, in, in conceive of it that way, um, if we, on the other hand, um, another view of royalty is simply a designator um, uh, for the grail bloodline uh, of enhanced, uh, genetically enhanced um, rulers uh, that was instigated by uh, en- Enki uh, way back and um, with the intention of uh, being servants of the people. Um, now, if if you look at royalty as being leaders and servants of the people, um, then that's that's a great deal different than what we what we have been taught is is royalty is somehow or other uh, they're special. But wow, and you know <laughs> it, it it gets a little bit it gets a little bit ridiculous. Whereas if we see that uh, these people have been trained for uh, through a tradition uh, for hundreds, maybe thousands, actually thousands of years, um, then then we can understand that, uh, yeah, um, they've been trained like um, this, our academics have been trained to to uh, have PhDs. Um, so that that's I'm I totally agree with you, but I'm saying that there is the other side of it, you know, to see. Yeah, I guess what what I'm concerned with as as a professional anthropologist is Paul Radin and others have shown that in every society, no matter what their economic base, there are are people that contemplate their existence and that are able to uh, uh, go beyond the matrix of their particular culture and they go all the way to source and they get uh, deep, deep intuitive knowledge, the Akashic records that are available to all human beings, whether they're of the royal blood or not. It's like inherent in each of us to have our way back to source, I think. Well, I'm curious about, uh, I know Gardner was talking about the original purpose of royalty, that Enki was creating this uh, this uh, grail bloodline to be in service. Can you tell us what was the original vision? How would these royals be in service and not be self-serving. They, they would be in service to other. What was the original um, concept? Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> in the most general form, I, I think it was um, what he had in mind was, first of all, that they would take over uh, when the Anunnaki themselves, who had been ruling the people, uh, would, would take over. And he wanted mm-hmm. them to do it in his way, not his brother Enlil's way, and mm-hmm. because Enlil was was a harsh taskmaster and uh, task master, and he said, um, you know, you're you're we made you with slaves, uh, we created you with slaves, and you damn well better um, keep your place and uh, not cause problems, and uh, do what you're told. Um, whereas Enki, um, having created us in the first place with his half sister and her son. Um, was a uh, was looking out for us uh, in a sense that I, he knew that we could and he wanted us to evolve. But in the meantime, uh, he wanted these uh, people to be trained uh, and follow a tradition of being servants of the people, so that they, the people, the, the general population would be taken care of. Um, and uh, would be um, helped in, in their evolution uh, and in their social structure and uh, just in, in their survival. So um, it's a matter of, of um, uh, like we we can conceive of in the new society that, that we are entering into, um, uh, we, we won't, certainly we don't want to have dictators um, or dominant dominant um, males who are, are pushing everybody around. Uh, we want somebody with uh, some real evolutionary smarts uh, 
be able to take care of the needs of the people and, and, and organize things for us. So what do you think went wrong? Well, I think... With Becky's um, plan, yeah. Well, I, I think you can see where it went wrong mostly, most uh, first, um, at the time, at about the time just before Jesus. Um, the real Jesus, uh, and I say the real Jesus because um, if when we study the Bible, um, we realize first of all that the um, Book of Genesis, particularly in most of the Old Testament, uh, was simply a rewrite um, three thousand years after the fact of uh, that that precise information uh, was put out by the Sumerian scholars. Um, and um, so, so that, um, um, well, it's, it's too complicated. I better not make it as complicated. <laughs> compli- <laughs> okay, we can, I, we as can I usually come do. Back to it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, well, uh, well let's was, skip that. Was, then. Well, it's still, you know, what people what what are basically Sitchin is saying is that well, Enki created the uh, order of the snake to pass on the knowledge to the, the kind of people you're uh, talking about, it got infiltrated. That's the story. It got infiltrated and taken over. And so that the secret societies went off in all kinds of other directions. Rather than benefiting humanity, it came down to benefiting uh, uh, themselves. And, and I guess the most horrible story, one of the most horrible, is, is uh, Ningashita, or uh, Toth, Kukulkan, uh taught these uh, boys uh, I'm, look, I'm going away, and uh, uh, you carry on the tradition and so forth. And when he and when he left, they became this uh, cabal that just murdered people. That were, were first their enemies, then their internal dissent, and then just it became terrible. And so uh, it's it's a lot of it is these people that were left in charge when the Anunnaki cycled off the planet. Uh, yeah, and those people were emulators and followers of Enlil, um, mm-hmm. who was the dominant uh, male chauvinist <laughs> um, slave master. And um, because that tradition uh, started by Enki um, by selecting a human uh, prize, human female in way back, uh, maybe even a little bit before uh, Sumer, um, he fathered a child by her. Uh, the child's name was Cain, and the old, the oldest uh, Jewish um, scriptures don't say that Cain was a bad guy who slew his brother. It says Cain was um, superior to Abel, and it turns out that uh, from Cain comes uh, kinship, kingship, and uh, he was the first of the uh, genetically enhanced through Enki. Uh, of the humans, uh, who was the king to be in the line of servants of the people. And that line went went through Sumer, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and was uh, active and uh, knowledgeable and uh, purposeful uh, in the Essenes, who was a community that had isolated themselves out in the desert, um, but was known to the uh, Jewish um, the Hebrew priests and, and scribes um, in the Jerusalem area, for instance, um, and they didn't like it. They 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 were Enlilites, um, and uh, so that when Jesus, who was an Essene, and um, came out of the Essene community with his wife, who was also royalty, um, Mary Magdalene, and their children. Uh, they 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 noted that he had arrived, and that's why that curious situation where they uh, they want to do him in. They don't want the bloodline kings. They want the Enlilites, and uh, so uh, they they trump up charges, and uh, Jesus ends up standing before um, what's his name uh, Pilate, and. Um, and um, yeah. the Jewish, I'm sorry. 
No, Rome didn't want to do it, and the priests didn't want to do it, and they were each trying to get the other one to uh, to kill Jesus uh, so that they wouldn't have to take the blame. Yeah, and he said, and the Roman ruler said to him, um, uh, you, you are a king, and Jesus said, you said it. Uh, I mean, it was that passage in, in the New Testament is... is it, it seems like an anomaly. It seems it seems weird. You know why he would say, would ask Jesus why, whether he was a king or not. But he knew the Romans knew about the bloodline and the fact that there those who were the uh, males that were produced were to be um, kings and um, had a purpose and and uh, standing uh, theoretically anyway. Um, both the the uh, Jews and the Romans and the Greeks and everybody else, um, but um, that's that's when things began to go downhill because they um, uh, the real Jesus was was the Essene. Uh, the Jesus of the New Testament is a synthetic character that was uh, put together in 365 A.D. Um, at a big console that that involved fist fights and everything else, uh, on on order of of Constantine the the Roman emperor. So um, yeah, and and since then the bloodline of kings, the Grail bloodline of kings, has been basically in in the woodwork um, and protecting themselves and not letting this stuff out because the Roman Church. Uh, knew about them, knew they didn't have the bloodline, uh, and the, the the Inquisition was was primarily to wipe out the bloodline. Um, you know, that we were taught in school, sure, it was, uh, the Inquisition was to uh, weed out heretics, and uh, it wasn't really nice that they stretched them on on uh, the rack and, and uh, murdered them and killed them and threw them to the lions and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they were heretics and uh, didn't have the right doctrine and so on and so on and so on. It was actually Roman Church uh, trying to wipe out that line of kings, the bloodline, um, because they were Enlil, um oriented Yeah, that's right. And, and, that's, and uh, exactly, it was a crime against Caesar uh, and the Enlilites way back in the time of Augustus to say you are a king, and so once they could get, uh, uh, once Jesus said you said it, uh, that was it as far as committing a crime against Augustus, this little sniveling brat who became uh, the holy, the, the, the emperor of Rome. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, so this is sibling rivalry, and it, it uh, filtered down to us. Uh, yeah. And um, on the other hand, uh, that's why I think that uh, Lawrence Gardner's work is is so important because, you know, he did he was uh, uh, enlisted, uh, hired by thirty royal families um, in Europe to do genealogical research for them, and it was obviously it was obvious to him um, quite a while after he started that. Uh, their purpose was to bring out um, their genealogical uh, work, uh, their, their genealogical uh, history. Um, uh, finally, after all this persecution by the um, uh, as as the bloodline, and so uh, he went to work uh, and, and had a unique access to their private archives, and uh, would and he uh, said. Uh, uh, in his book, that he um, uh, said to them, uh, "What is this this line of kings that runs all through your genealogies and so on?" And they said, "You know, they tried to shuffle it off a little bit, but they knew what he was talking about." And uh, he said, "No, no, don't, don't, you know, don't, don't try to fool me. Oh, what is this?" And they said, "Well, that's the Grail bloodline." And so um, he was instrumental in doing this deep, meticulous research and uh, getting the, the truth out there so that we would understand what this bloodline was and what his purpose was. 
Um, and I think he he did us a great favor, and them too. Um, but uh, and now the church is not. Um, I mean, there still is a, a department of Inquisition <laughs> in the Roman Church, um, but they don't um, they don't they don't murder and uh, hang and and uh, behead and um, like they used to. <laughs> like like. Like they used to, yeah. So, what what do you think was behind the royals suddenly wanting to know their bloodlines? Are they trying to find out who's the true king of uh, perhaps England or the world, or what? What are they? What? Why were the royals looking for their, this bloodline? And to make, hopefully, I guess they were trying to identify it within their own blood. Well, I think, I think it was it was that they they already knew that they knew from their their private genealogies and everything that, that they finally uh, allowed to go public through um, uh, uh, Lawrence Gardner. But it, it wasn't so much that they didn't know, but they, as they did know, but they wanted to make it public uh, so that, that um, you know, the, the, because it was time. That, that's it. Right. I you, mean, know, they, you know, when... One thing I really worry about is this messianic uh, attitude that there's got to be uh, somebody who's so superior that we should all do what that uh, person uh, says. And I think that uh, what I find is that people are more accepting of whatever solution they come up with if they are contributing to it rather than being told what to do. Oh, well, absolutely. And and I think that that's the nature of the, the new paradigm. Um, because I think that the the concept of a, a royal bloodline uh king um, was more like a public official uh like a president who was who was uh, uh, who who everybody dumped on <laughs> uh, to to take responsibility for organizing uh you know the the society and so on it wasn't so much that they were looking or um, the the concept of the of the bloodline king was not to be a dictator uh, or a a, a a general or anything like that, but but somebody who uh, you know could could take over um, the the well being of everybody in society in the sense that. Um, by by making suggestions and and um, um, using good sense um, would would act as a as a CEO maybe. Um, but who would that so be I'd, now? Who who is it? Well, right now, um, um, what's his name? Um, Harry Prince. There is William. a. Um, oh yeah, the one in uh, Scotland. Is, yeah, Scotland. Uh, is it William? Prince, no, no, um, no. We're we're looking at the um, it, the story is that they they wanted to marry um, the bloodline into the the British uh, throne, so they that's why they had Diana because she had the bloodline on both sides, or she was descended from both Jesus and James. Right. So now the right. children Henry, I mean uh, Harry and William have the Grail bloodline, right. and but there's the other fellow in Scotland that you talked about in the previous episode. I'm sorry. Prince Michael. Prince Michael, right, of Scotland. And so what uh, are they going to are they going to go back to the original concept? I mean, we're just being hypothetical here, but I'm just trying to think this through. So they went through all this trouble to to breed Charles with Diana, now they have these children with the Grail bloodline. Oh, uh, what were, were they going back on? Are they are they coming into Anki's clan now? They murdered uh, away Diana. From, uh, yeah, but they murdered Diana. <laughs> yeah, this is confusing. What do you, what do you think? You know, I I have to say I don't know what their what they what their conceptual uh, framework is at, is at this particular point. Whether they figure it's good enough to have those two kids in there, um, just as as token bloodline. And therefore, some kind of justification for them to be on the English throne because they were German and, and took it over. Um, yeah. And um, or if somebody um, 
is, has the consciousness and the smarts to set, to train these young guys um, in the in the depth of the of the Grail tradition. Um, but I, from what I've read about the the two young guys, um, marriages and so on, I I don't think I see <laughs> too much of that part. Of right. It. So what's what's our way out of this mess that we're in? It kind of went awry <laughs> around Jesus' time, and and uh, so we apparently are under some kind of en- Enlilite rule. We're in their paradigm. They've got the, they've got the the worldview here, the zeitgeist. Yeah, Nanar may be still around as Allah too. And they seem to have factions, kind of like Orwell's eighty four. They've got the the Allah and the Yahweh and the Adonai faction, or some kind of ongoing global war so it's an excuse to kill us off and use us as pawns in this well, I think not that, stop that, war I, I think that the um, that the bloodline has to be dealt with um, in the form that it is in now uh, where it's kind of degenerated uh, into an unknown kind of thing um, the same as we have to deal with the the one percent, the elite, and those who um, have been the winners in the um, uh, competition. And um, so, tell us more about the winter. The, how can we make this a win for everybody, and even for the winners? Well, um, you know, I one of the ways that I have found in my own thinking. Um, for some time has been like, okay, we have to deal with um, them sort of on a special basis uh, and we have to deal with uh, the general public as in America uh, or Europe or Asia or whatever. But um, it occurred to me uh, just today, I, I picked up a magazine, I can't, I think it was I think it was a copy of uh, National Geographic, and um, it was um, an account r- written by a young man who uh, uh, went and lived, I think, two years with the Aborigine people in Australia. Now they they have purposely withdrawn uh, back into what we would consider. Uh, to be a very primitive lifestyle, although they do have cell phones, they have flat screen TVs, uh, you know, it, some of the good stuff they've latched onto, and uh, they've had to um, outlaw alcohol because it was it was wrecking a lot of them, uh, and so on, so on, so on. And so here we have a primitive population. Um, that needs to be integrated into the new society. Uh, And I'm sure that there are probably at least still half a dozen tribes in the Brazilian jungles who are uh, fully human, (laughs) there's no question about it, um, who live a a very primitive lifestyle and um, who are out of touch with um, the information society that we live in now. So we, well, I think we, it is absolutely imperative that we think in terms of the entire spectrum of the most civilized uh, and the most primitive. And so that, that expands the difficulty. Um, but I think that, that um, if we pay attention to the drives of our evolution, physically, mentally, consciously, psychologically, um, that we, those of us who can uh, handle it, um, will be able to contribute. And if we can begin to educate the in, entire population um, as to the benefits and the evolutionary potential of the new paradigm, um, we we will make progress and we'll be able to integrate everybody um, because there, there will be parts of, of the population who, knowing the new paradigm, will, by their 
genetic programming, their their nature, uh, will want to go into the uh, Amazon jungle um, and um, and and do it properly uh, and respectfully, and uh, try to uh, let those people see uh, what the benefits would be, uh, educate them, and. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like an almost impossible task, but I don't think it's going to be because the, the evolutionary drive is already manifest in in our societies and in our uh, cultures. And um, it, 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 the one major problem is the absolutes of religion, and that's why I've been focused so long and hard. Um, first book, Breaking the God Spell. Um, let's look at Sitchin's total information, recognize that the Anunnaki were flesh and blood humanoids and um, aliens, and they in- invented us, and that the uh, evolutionist and the creationist are both half right and half wrong. There was a creation, but it was in a genetic laboratory, and uh, you just can't rewrite you know, Genesis uh, to try to make it up, um, and, and we are evolving, but we're not evolving uh, in, a, in a Darwinian sense, um, because you know, uh, uh, Darwin and, and the um, Darwinian evolution uh, looks to um, uh, progress in, in terms of millions of years. Um, and it took uh, Homo erectus, I believe it was, uh, th- um, almost a million years go from rough flake stone tools to smooth ones, <laughs> whereas we have gone, in 200,000 years, we've gone from square one, getting invented in a genetic laboratory, to um, Mars. Um, so um, it, it, that's a, that is a crux, um, critical problem. Uh, the absolutes of religion, we have to, um, that, and, and that's why I wrote the letter that uh, you have in your hands uh, to the Pope, um, because right. we, need to, we need to do it from the top down, um, and it's, it's, quite frankly, a bitch of a problem, I'm sure, for him uh, to deal with two billion Catholics over the planet um, to, if he, if he really thinks that he needs to do it to turn it around from some kind of supernatural religion into a political um, and and sociological um, phenomenon. (laughs) You know, know, it seems that our our advancements are really punctuated by the gifts of technology and information that the uh, Anunnaki are periodically willing to give us when they uh, have their nearing of the pl- their planet uh, to two hours, and so that now that we're conscious of it, we can. Uh, that's one thing we can demand it. And I guess what gives me really hope is that uh, people come around in their own hearts. And I guess Jimmy Carter is one of my ishi devas or paragons of how you can be even those people at the very top. Uh, are capable of empathy and breaking uh, the one-upsmanship and becoming real human beings. That's what I think. Sure. Tell, us more, tell us more about this new paradigm. How do you see it? Well, when I say new paradigm, I'm simply talking about a new, whole new civilization, uh, human civilization. And so... Um, you know, one chapter is on <laughs> economics. We need to go beyond uh, money. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, beyond credit. Um, and and it's, it's fascinating to me that uh, just recently I discovered some articles by academics, um, professors who are talking about... Um, a subsistence, um, what would you call it? Subsistence wage, but it's it's not even the wage. It it is um, a system by which uh, every individual on the planet gets a certain 
basic income, uh, that would be a start. Um, we need to go beyond incomes. Uh, we need to go to um, the distribution of whatever is needed uh, for uh, food, clothing, and shelter, and recreation and education and all that kind of stuff. And and um, we and we do have the technologies in artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, um, and so on that that will allow us to do that. Um, but it's, it is such a radical change that it will take a while, quite a while. And okay, so that's that's subsistence. Well, subsistence is is kind of a weak term. Um, not and survival certainly is even weaker. Um, but um, maintenance um, for everybody, for every individual on the planet, we could we could handle. 10 billion people instead of just seven, um, if we did it right. And, but it would have to be a cooperative uh, planetary um, effort and uh, coordinated. And that's where um, those who have the consciousness um, would, would do well um, as, as CEOs. Um, How do we but, get disarmament? How do we stop the arms well, let's, race? Let's talk about the economics, and then we'll go to disarmament. Hey, what if we gave everybody, I don't know, let's say $35,000 a year. Every man, woman, child would get $35,000 a year, and they put their roof over their head, they feed themselves, they clothe themselves. They, I mean, is there a basic number that you could – it would be cheaper to give it to everybody, and then they, they're going to spend it. They're not going to, like, hoard it. <laughs> they're going to need it to survive, Right. It'll just right. go back into the economy. Yeah, and there is, um, uh, and and the academic um, uh, discussions that are already going on. Um, there is, a, um, let's see, I'm looking quickly here. Um, even the World Economic Forum in Davos um, saw intense debate. It says here about the future of capitalism. So um, if, if we can enlist those who are the winners in the capitalist system to figure out an even better system, not, not a, a, uh, the elimination of capitalism, but a better system of um, sustenance and maintenance for every person on the planet, um, and, we can, and the academics are, are ready to work on it, uh, but the, what I was looking for here is that um, there is discussion among the academics who are uh, putting out these uh, theories, uh, and uh, some of them want to give, you know, thirty-five thousand dollars. Some of them want to give fifty thousand dollars. Some of them want to give only whatever the minimum um, poverty line uh, economic assistance is, um, and it's and. Uh, Sasha, you, you probably will, when you start to get into this stuff, if you haven't already, uh, be fascinated by the psychology of the individual academics and, um, and, and capitalists um, who, who are, are discussing these things. Um, you, you can see how they, they think of the ordinary person, <laughs> um, you know, like oh, yeah. we just... Thirty-five thousand, or fifty thousand, or, or, uh, you know, well, well, who's gonna, who's gonna, who's gonna make the, the things that we need, and um, um, my theory in, in, in that case, w which has not been really discovered too much by, um, uh, discussed by, by the academics, um, is. Well, that I, was, I just wanted to. Uh, I'm sorry that was a little um, interruption there, but the Pope has demanded the redistribution, a legitimate redistribution of wealth. I was trying to get the article, but it launches into a <laughs> YouTube. Um, so we're we're talking. People are addressing this on all levels, including the Pope. Maybe he got your letter. Um, gee, I hope he did. Um, I didn't expect a, an answer. Um, Although I know he did did come back at Rush Limbaugh when Rush Limbaugh <laughs> criticized him, 
Well, um, maybe that's it, like the answer. Instead of doing it one on one, it'll be some kind of um, response uh, globally. So there, there we have the Pope addressing this unfairness of of um, you know people being in poverty while there's a super super rich. Uh, you know, it's like the fox watching a, wa- uh, you know watching the hen house. Uh, the Pope is uh, the Antichrist, for heaven's sake. I know, but they've got to walk a fine line. Maybe they're have some compassion. Well, um, it's just so out of balance now, so extreme that everybody can see it. It's not just, you know, the old the old way it was. Oh, you people are lazy. They're not working. They're lazy. But th- th- this is beyond that. It's it's just so oh, obvious. There's something beyond. really wrong with the basic system of society that there's so many people starving. They're not lazy. They're just this isn't working. Yeah. And and uh, the and of course the economics. Are very basic, um, but the and that's one chapter in in this whole discussion and development of theory and and uh, paradigm, um, because we we need to uh, talk about uh, the transmutation of religion uh, to what it really is, um, because we we know that Enki and Enlil were. Adonai the Lord and, and Jehovah Yahweh, um, and that you know that's that is a major major uh, thing that that the Pope um, and any religious leader or religious person in the world has to uh, come up against. It, it mm-hmm. certainly is not it is not atheism. Um, um, it doesn't have anything to do with whether there is a thinkable or unthinkable being out there who can create. 16 universes just by thinking them on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's 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 that would be atheism if you denied that. Um, but um, just come into grips with the fact that the God of the uh, dominant God-turned religions uh, are two brothers, two two alien brothers, uh, Enki and Enlil. Um, you know, there's is, a, there's, an, there's another factor too. The founder of our uh, discipline, a guy named Emil Durkheim, uh, showed that what happens when people sing together or do sports together, for that matter, but in the churches, people actually do have spiritual experiences of transcending their own separate self and feeling at one with uh, other people and with with the universe. And so it's it's like you've, you've got to burn the structure, but take the spiritual uh, connectedness uh, uh, out of out of it. It's the hierarchy that subverts the thing for its own purposes every time, I think. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, the and and um, whether you do it by uh, singing together um, or meditating or Tantra or uh, LSD, uh, you know, that that's the expansion of, of human consciousness into greater and greater dimensions. I think is the most generic definition of spirituality and metaphysics. Um, yeah. And and um, I, no, I I, I, I agree. I should. The um, oh, <laughs> we need we need to uh, restore to ourselves the uh, generic human um, as opposed to the so-called supernatural. Um, uh, techniques mm-hmm. and so on that that ex- expand our consciousness, um, but the but economics are are, ju- are just one chapter in this whole transmutation of the human species, um, and um, one of the things that that was was really hitting home to me uh, this evening when I was thinking about it uh, is the the broadness of the spectrum of the the people. Um, whether they be, um, you know, uh, they have their own castle in Dubai, um, and uh, with the most civilized uh, type of, of uh, living accommodations or whatever, to the people, or the Aborigines in Australia, or the people in, in the, perhaps the Amazon jungle, uh, we, you've got to be able to uh, conceive of a way of integrating. Uh, all of those, um, and uh, let's let's talk about uh, the the uh, 
elimination of war. You know, that's another chapter. You bet. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that one? And I just wanted to give you a heads up. We have four and a half minutes left, but we can go over because this is all going to be in the archives. I just our agreement was one hour, but if we can just keep going. One way to de-escalate is universal is is, is a giving. Just plain start making a concession. For example, uh, if the Israelis were to say, "Look, let's make Jerusalem international," and they offer something to begin with, start with a with a. Uh, a, a, a gesture of giving and start the channel of giving instead of uh, resisting, I think. Well, it's, yeah, and and of course, the way the press uh, presents it most of the time and the way the Israelis, Netanyahu or whomever, um, presents it usually is in terms of... Uh, just political stubbornness or um, argumentation. Whereas every once in a while, um, one of the officials will say, well, you know, in effect, we're the chosen people of God, and this land was given to us way back, and um, and uh, so just, you know, just buzz off. Um, and and it's in is that re, those religious uh concepts and um uh, whatever that that are the real obstacles in this thing yeah so how do how do we get around all this what's your thoughts well um uh, fantasy on my part but let's yeah, say yeah we're going to go fantasy okay uh the pope and the dalai lama and maybe the new president of Iran um, could get together because um, you know and and say, look, uh, this is this is ridiculous. Uh, we we have to um, basically reform the entire context. Can't do it inside the box, um, as I said, and in, in try to get through to the Pope in, in the uh, letter. Uh, it's not a matter of, of uh, just repairing things or or improving the situation. It's it's that the context itself uh, needs to be rede- redefined, and that's that's where the difficulties lie. But um, if you if if and that's why C. B. Scott Jones and I are starting from the top down, from from the Pope or the the uh, the new president of Iran, who seems to be fairly enlightened and level-headed guy um, who has made some statements that, that had blown me away. Um, and um, have, maybe, you, have you said this to to Obama? No, I agree uh, yes, with you, I, Neil. It's, imp- it's really imperative. This, this guy is saying, we will, we'll, we will guarantee that we don't do nuclear weapons. We're willing to make a deal. If only... If only the neocoms can be stopped from uh, bombing uh, Iran before the, uh, this, this, this uh, Iranian president who is saying let's have peace it wants to try to create it. Yeah. Well, I think uh, when you look at the situation with Iran and, and Obama, and by the way, I, I did send a copy of the letter to the Pope to Obama to say, you know, oh, this is this is what needs to be done. And... Um, I think that that um, I mean my appreciation of, of Obama is that he is a pretty masterful diplomat, and somehow or other um, the situation got totally chilled out with Iran, and then there was Syria, and that got that got worked out, and nobody or, or hardly anybody got killed or. You know, uh, uh, there was no war, there was no battles. It was either one of these. Um, I think that him spending an hour at a time on the phone with Putin uh, has uh, eliminated... uh, Well, I I saw a video the other day on YouTube of um, soldiers. Um, It's hard. You you need a damn program to figure out who is... uh, Russian sympathizers and Ukrainians and so on and so on and so on. But um, the, the soldiers were 
were actually um, disarming themselves, taking the, the um, firing pin out of their guns and stuff, and turning them over into a, into to uh, somebody a civilian. Uh, who was putting him in a plastic shopping bag? I mean, this was this this was irony wow. of, a, of a very strange kind. And you can probably see that video uh, if you. Uh, it's on YouTube. It on YouTube, uh, uh, showing using the search word um, as a key um, disarmament. Uh, disarmament. U- Ukrainian disarmament, something like that. <laughs> I mean. The, the people were the people stopped the tanks and and you could see that the younger soldiers particularly and even the the officers the older officers uh it was like yeah you know we we want to we don't want to do this stupid ass stuff anymore <laughs> great <laughs> yeah. that's awesome and, and well, I that's think where it, it's part. where the universal soldier comes into play. You know, you get your orders, but who, you know, talk about that, honey. They, we're all you're, responsible. You're only responsible for yourself, and so, you know, go ahead. Oh, it's, it's perfectly obvious we're all responsible for what we do, whether you know, whether it's support war industry, uh, making munitions, uh, uh, any any we could uh, one of the basic human sanctions uh, in, in anthropology we say is a nullity. Stop participating. Stop funding uh, these uh, terrible, terrible things. You know, uh, and some of the uh, military inventions can be turned to good civilian use. Nibiru or the uh, 180 degree Lagrange points are coming through, and we have obstacles which could cause extinction level events that some of the military technology may be able to save us from. Sure. And I, I, I see, I project, um, soon, I, I hesitate to say soon, but I think soon, with the transparency of the web and um, the fact that the younger generations, um, oh, like the, the college kids in, oh, what, oh, God. What in a university just recently, um, Condoleezza Rice was hired for thirty-five thousand dollars to give the commencement address. Did you see that article? I, I didn't um, see it, but go. Yeah, and and uh, and the students um, um, mounted a protest, and one of the history uh, professors was involved, and they they actually uh, created such a fuss and said that she was a war criminal because she was involved with uh, the uh, Iraqis. Um, um, situation with the Bush mm-hmm. administration, and uh, she she uh, withdrew. <laughs> and and so, uh, yeah, and, and you can see that on the web too. I think. Um, anyway, the the idea is that um, uh, somehow or other, somebody. I'd like to I'd like to do it myself, but I haven't been able to figure out how to do it yet. Um, start a, a major um, educational program and protest uh, to get the young, generally, the younger generations, to just simply refuse to, to participate in war. You know, yes. I, I won't be drafted, and uh, here's, here's uh, two million of us. Uh, you want to put two million of us in a... Uh, in a, uh, a camp, <laughs> you know, because we're uh, conscientious objectors. Uh, it, you know, it, it's crazy. I think that that uh, the younger generations will just opt out, and uh, that that uh, huge cemetery of acres and acres and acres up there on the hill in Santa Fe um, won't get any bigger. Uh, and the other thing is that, that driving force on the very, very poor people to join the volunteer army because it's just as dangerous and more dangerous in the ghetto than it was in Nam. And and basically, when you have a volunteer army, you're pushing the poor people. How many Congress people's uh, children are in the uh, in the kill zone? No, it's the poor people that are forced by economic circumstances to serve too. Sure, and, sure. And I like your vision about the you know the two million young men and, and women in America, you know, just not participating. But how do we enlist the whole world? 
all the children, all the young men and women of the world to just say, you know, maybe it's as simple as just saying it on this show and other shows. Lay down your arms. Stop participating. Because they're going to take the young. They don't really want us old people. We're, we're 60, 70. Michael years. Jackson used to have them all sing together all over the world. Uh, and that really seemed to do, it really changed things. I saw what he did in Rio de Janeiro. Right, yeah. So, because it, it takes the young to do it. They're not going to march off 50-year-olds. They're going to take the young between 18 and, and 40. They're the ones that are going to go. Yeah. So military conscription is slavery. It is the worst. It is a terrible slavery where you're forced to either kill other people or be killed yourself. This is the stupidest thing uh, a, a, a species can possibly do, in my opinion. Oh yeah, um, there's no question about it. And we started it by emulating the uh, some of the Anunnaki factions um, who used us as slaves and soldiers uh, in their own personal. Conflicts, um, you know that 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 white that uh, those rows of white crosses um, practically bring tears to my eyes when I drive by there. Um, it's <laughs> it's insanity. Oh, it is. I, I think Gore Vidal talked about. He just didn't understand how thousands and thousands of people would run and throw their chests in front of uh, cascading bullets from machine guns. And think they were doing a wonderful thing by doing that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, uh, we have this this um, uh, religious based, um, uh, you know, self emulation where people burn themselves alive. And um, I think that the Dalai Lama has kind of squelched that with the monks because the monks were using that as a protest in Tibet, but. Um, because he's he's a pretty cool hand, um, and mm-hmm. he's got a got a good sense of humor. But uh, still, uh, the Middle Easterns uh, people that you know they they strap on the, the uh, explosives, they get in a truck or a car, and they drive into some place and blow themselves up and kill forty people and wound a hundred and, um, and 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 you know they they think that they're going to go to a paradise. Um, if they do that kind of stuff, so um, how do we reach them? Well, you know, uh, one th- one thing that we found out about the uh, Munich uh, Olympics murderers is that uh, the terrorists that killed all the Israeli athletes is that when they got married and got jobs and uh, became uh, fam- uh, family people, they weren't terrorists anymore, and that is basically where it's at. This kind of thing that you were talking about, basic maintenance and, and opportunity to have some. Uh, stimulation, sure. People's basic needs, instead of uh, making them uh, so starved for uh, for sex and sustenance that they that life isn't worth anything to them. But I think what we're we're addressing with these young people that strip, uh, strap uh, bombs on themselves, and you know they're not surviving to to wake up to realize that you know they can move beyond that. They're they're reacting to some kind of programming, which I think is what you were talking about, Neil, when you. We're addressing breaking the God spell. They're in some kind of belief system that if I do this, I'm I'm. I, I heard one person say that the, they they believe that if they did that, they would save their grandmother's soul and their mother's souls, and and it was fast track not only to heaven for them but for their ancestors or their, their people that preceded them. So, what do we do with this type of indoctrination that results in this type of uh, sacrifice? Well. I can only I, I I reflect back on my own youth. You know, I was baptized a Catholic, um, um, raised a Catholic, uh, went to Catholic school, uh, studied for the priesthood, um, and uh, into my early twenties, I was uh, a Trappist monk for a while. Uh, studied with the Franciscans and the Sulpicians and so on. And and it, when you are as a child um, and programmed uh, which is what it is um, and there is nobody really contradicting it for you um, if you're lucky uh, you you begin to investigate and uh, you get enough information say uh, hey Wam, um, 
hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hey, wait well, a minute. Some you know, of us wake up and some of us don't, so that's something to look at. You know, what what creates that awakening between, well, your contactee, so maybe that was just waiting. Well, you know, we've already mentioned that, that uh, there are lots and lots of paths. Meditation, holotropic breath work, and theogens are uh, very useful. They've been used from the uh, from the get go. Uh, um, any kind of satori or unity experience lets you get out of your little uh, everyday self and get the bigger picture. I think. Sure, 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 and and um, you know, I think. It, well, I, I, I would, sometimes I think what we ought to do is uh, um, put kids through uh, LSD sessions. Um, <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, I've seen what it does. Uh, 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 working with thousands of people uh, on, in, in journey work, and it really allows the multiverses and the possibilities and the access of past lives and the uh, Akashic records and it and it allows one to uh, meditate on oneself meditating all the way back to the uh, uh, metacosmic void and Leela, the divine play that makes all the dichotomies we live with. Well, that's Absolutely. what the concept was with this move is maybe I saw Solarium or Solaris or something like that. They said that when we finally align with the galactic core, and uh, then we'll simultaneously all have a DMT experience because the light will come through and activate our pineal, pineal gland. And then we will all wake up all at once. So that was a bunch of phys- physicists that said that we were going to be doing this alignment. And that's how we'll break the spell. You know, like uh, Sleeping Beauty, we're all going to just wake <laughs> up at the same time and go, oh, my God, what were we doing? What were we thinking? But I don't know if, if that's going to happen, but it's a great idea. Well, you know, by by being positive and, and having a good attitude. If we're wrong and, and we get wiped out, well, at least we had a good time while we're here. But you know, uh, let's 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 face it positively and enjoy the moments <laughs> we have. And if this is all we have, at least those were good. Now, I think there's a way out of this uh, chess game, this poker game. I think there's a way that we can do this, and that's why we're dialoguing. I just wondered, Neil, if you what what ideas you have and. Maybe we'll, something will come to us, but there's got to be some ways of waking up the world. Well, you see, that's that's to go back to my kind of original um, position. Uh, the idea, of, uh, my concept of it is that what is happening now is that we are in, indeed doing that, but um, we're we're doing it on a haphazard kind of basis and. Um, so much of the old stuff is still in place, uh, the old programming and the Godspell and so on, so on, so on. Uh, what the, the idea is that we make, we need to make it more and more conscious um, so that people understand what evolution is, is driving us to in, in the first place. Um, and, of course, evolution, uh, you say that to Tea Party people or or to radical fundamentalists, religious fundamentalists, and uh, you're immediately, um, you know, considered to be uh, an atheist or okay. or something. Yeah. Whereas, where as just as science has slowly um, a, a changed religious doctrine. I mean, we we've, we've gone from the um, you know, the Earth as the center of the universe <laughs> uh, to uh, the Earth at least rotating around the sun. Um, and that was that was purely through science. I mean, the weight of the information um, th- that is building up uh, will be probably the, the major major factor in the, in, in the turnaround. Um, when we, uh, you know, look at, at the... Uh, uh, ju- just recently on, on the web, I've seen a couple of articles um, that says that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who's a really good presenter, um, has been, you know, people are going out of their minds, religious fundamentalists, because he's saying, you know, there is a thing, there is 
an evolutionary process going on. We're evolving, um, and it's in terms of millions of years, and the uh, age of the Earth is in billions of years, and so on, and so on, and so on. Instead of the the uh, literal interpretation that the fundamentalists have, that uh, uh, some god showed up here. Um, on schedule and uh, created the earth and everything in it in six days. Um, uh, so what's this uh, guy's name again? Tyson is the last name. What's the first name? Oh, Neil. DeGrasse. Oh, Neil Tyson. DeGrasse. Neil Tyson. Well, Neil DeGrasse Neil Tyson. Tyson. Name. DeGrasse um, Tyson. Yeah, he's he is um, African American. You, you've seen him on TV. Uh, on no, his, I don't have TV. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, I, that. Um, he, he presents uh, uh, on one of the science channels and uh, does a good job of explaining scientific information uh, and a lot of the more advanced things in layman's terms. And, uh, oh, great. But just, just recently he's been making these statements um, matter-of-factly, and uh, there's there's a bunch of religious people out there that are are demanding that uh, he'd be put off TV or or uh, off the channel or <laughs> whatever. Wow. But uh, the thing is that, th- th- I mean, my my general point there was that um, science can can be very very effective because if if you're going to send your kid to a college uh, and you're uh, you, the only college that you can send him to is uh, some cockamamie place, a religious place, that's going to teach him uh, about the Bible being uh, infallible and the earth being created in six days and stuff. Well, that that's an option, I suppose. Um, but um, most people, you know, think twice, and they send them to uh, decent colleges, and, and the decent colleges are all teaching um, at least Darwinian evolution, if not um, you know, um, our our actual type of, of uh, evolution. And um, I wrote a letter to, to uh, Neil Tyson recently, um, pretty much along the same lines as um, the the letter I sent to the Pope, uh, saying, here's, a, you know, you want some real ammunition, try this, um, so that maybe we can get him past um, the standard academic presentation of, of evolution and so on. Did he write it back? No. I, I, no. I, um, I, I imagine these people get, you know, tons and tons of letters and email and everything else every day. And so um, if he... Well, I'll, I'll he, try to get him on a show. How's that? <laughs> Why not? Sometimes they Why respond. Not? They say, "Hey, I, I, I would like to have you on a radio show," and I get some response to that. And I, I'm surprised sometimes. All right. Well, we're uh, running. We're out of time here, actually. So um, I think we should call this quits. We can do it another time. Any final oh. words to our listeners? Um. Uh, yeah. It, 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 if we have to do it individually, uh, let's. Bring the transmutation of our and uh, you know consciously um, teach the trajectory of our evolution. Um, and if we have to do it individually, let's do it. Um, and then get together in groups um, because it's time, and um, uh, we can have a, a lot of effect. And um, we need to do it for the kids. Sasha, Have final it, words? Uh, yeah, um, I'd say get rid of hierarchy. Respect the light that each person from their own uh, particular vantage has to shine on uh, existence, and we have a, a, a thousand and more points of light, and we become illuminated. Anything yeah. else you want to say, Neil? We sound like you had one more thing to say. No, just that... Um Love to you two guys, and uh, it's really, it's really exciting and a pleasure to to interview with you because you're, you know, you're you're thinking about this stuff way out front. Um, I think I, you know, for a while UFO programs were 
were great stuff, um, but I think it we're, we've, we're recycling that stuff now. We, we just have to um, – we can't wait for disclosure by uh, some authority or something. Uh, right. We just need to get out there in front. That's right. When we get disclosure, it's probably going to just be another bunch of disinformation anyway. Well, this is disclosure. We're just talking about I mean, it. governmental dis- right. disclosure. So we're going to get oh, yeah. this out far and wide, and we can do some more. Uh, we can do it next week, the following week, whatever we feel inclined. And um, I'm just uh, not sure if we're getting all this recording. I have to go back and listen. But I, oh, I would like to uh, tell people to do look at our site. We have some actual photographs of um, large motherships near the sun. Uh, they're triangular shaped that are actually shooting down debris that's coming into the inner solar system. Uh, wh- one of the things that's happening now is Nemesis, uh, the uh, binary of Earth, if there is such a thing, but for what, we don't know what the cause is exactly. All the planets are moving closer together, and so there's a lot of, uh, uh, of a disturbance in the atmosphere, and we are facing some uh, real severe environmental uh, astronomical challenges. I hope yeah. <laughs> but Well, I think we can see it as, um, uh, I mean, climate change and earth changes <clears throat> as uh, the early effects of the incoming 10th planet. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, anytime um, you see a, a space, uh, just give me a call or uh, email Thank or you. whatever. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we could uh, pick this up again next Friday if you'd like to. I've got an opening then, and, and uh, I would like people to to really get the books uh, of uh, you know getting rid of the God spell. Yeah, what's uh, your books uh, names? Of your books? Oh, oh. Um, they can go on Amazon dot com and put type my name in Neil N E I L F R E E R Freer, and uh, all my books are listed there. Uh, Breaking the God Spell, which is the first one I did in um, 80-something. And um, the second one is called uh, God Games, What Do You Do Forever? And the third one is uh, Sapiens Rising, The View from 2100. And uh, they're all available. Uh, Sapiens Rising is only available on Kindle. um, But um, if somebody wants it um, a lot, um, I probably could furnish a PDF copy, you know, that they could... um, handle on their computer. So, uh, yeah, and my website is www.neilfreer.com, and then our uh, think tank website is cosmichumanity, all one word, dot org, not com, but org. org. And um, so I'm going to head down, and you guys... Um, oh, I just want to say one more thing. It would be great to have sure. C.B. Jones on, and we could uh, have... A round table with him, and anyway, I'm gonna. I'm not 100 percent sure that we're getting recorded, so I didn't <laughs> want to keep going on forever. But um, I'll, I'll check back on it. I will be in contact with you. Our normal channel that we have. I'm not gonna tell the world. Uh, Neil and I talk all the time. <laughs> all right. Well, much love to you, and uh, love and blessings to all our listeners out there. Thank you for joining us. And Aloha. Aloha. Uh, good night. Good night.